we decided to roll these two sessions, um, GCSE, uh, Odyssey component, and the A-level uh, World of the Hero Odyssey component uh, together, because it's the same text. And indeed, the actual set books are repeated uh, one from, from the other, which seems to me quite extraordinary, actually. I mean, one way of getting around that problem would be, for example, to have had a bit more um, uh, some of the books that, that have been, been left out, you know, that you could have supplemented. Anyway, that's not what happened. So what I thought I'd do today is, I actually need a copy of that handout. Is, can I, sorry, is there a spare one? Thank you so much. This is actually starting with the GCSE, for those of you who are thinking possibly of introducing the GCSE, but my actual PowerPoint is going to be very simply on um, Odysseus as a hero that's kind of multi-purpose, if you like. The um, thing with specs, I think, is always to try and get inside the mind of the person who wrote them, like why did they pick particular books? And the GCSE specs, which are, uh, the books are 9, 10, and then 19, 21, and 22, have clearly got uh, two things very obviously to say about them. The first is that we're given two different kinds of narrative voice, because 9 to 10 are in Odysseus's own voice. This is the birth of autobiography, really, in, in the Western tradition. This is him telling us his version of what's happened. And the other ones are very much um, Odysseus, just as much under Homer's microscope as anyone else. And one of the uh, interesting things to, to do with anybody that you're discussing the Odyssey with or talk about uh, the Odyssey too is how far Odysseus, um, does he talk himself up in his autobiographical accounts? Does he behave differently? What is going on? Who, who is the Odysseus that is told by the eye voice uh, in comparison with the Odysseus that's uh, told by the uh, omniscient, all-knowing, Homeric narrator. And I'm actually just going to take you through, um, on page two, the topics for the GCSE um, for the uh, excerpts that the, they're asked to comment on and the essays that they're asked to write, or, or short essays they're asked to write. These are the... Uh, four topics they're supposed to cover. Simply him as a storyteller and the idea of epic, including how the Odyssey might have been composed and performed, what makes the Odyssey an epic poem, what does epic mean, and narrative and descriptive techniques, including, and they're very, very specific, similes, epithets, and formulae. And because there are very, very many other features of oral poetry, for example, catalogues, ring composition, um, there's all kinds of different technical things that are done. Uh, I think it's important to keep one's eyes on those and encourage the young as they're reading it to collect interesting similes, epithets and formulae. You could even have a sort of blackboard or bit of your wall or something which has got, you know, similes that they can, epithets and formulae. I'm going to take you through some of the formulae just for Odysseus later. And then there are only, though, four, I think, Greek words. Let me have a look. The concept and importance of, under themes, xenia, all right, guest friendship. Um, deceit and trickery, civilization and barbaration, barbarism of places and characters, the role of revenge and justice, the concept of nostos, the uh, act of coming home, or as the specs gloss it, the desire to come home, it's actually the act of coming home, and the role of fate, then Odysseus is extraordinarily central. <laughs> the qualities of Odysseus as leader, husband, father, warrior, hero, his intelligence, his oratorical skills, and, above all, and his relationship with his uh, particular mentor, goddess Athena, and then gods, suitors, the crew, 
Polyphemus as a monster and a keeper of livestock, Circe is a witch and a host, Penelope is host, wife, queen, Telemachus is a son and a hero, and a loyalty or disloyalty of Odysseus's slaves. So it's actually, compared with some of the rubrics, quite simple and not too big, if, if you see what I mean. Actually, it's only two Greek words there, that Xenia and Nostos. In the A-level, I think there's four for um, the Odyssey. Kleos, fame or reputation. Time, the sense of honour. And Xenia again. And Nostos again. So you just had two more Greek words. It's not actually a huge amount. Um, and because a lot of your kids may know words like xenophobic or nostalgia, uh, it, it, I don't think this represents a particularly huge challenge. So why has the examiner specs writer chosen these particular books? What obviously connects them is the, that they are all Xenia books. They are all about arrival in a community and how you're treated there. And Xenia is so much more important to the Odyssey than the Iliad. It's one of the fundamental differences. The very, very basis of the Iliad, uh, the whole siege of Troy was caused by an infringement of Xenia when Alexander ran off Paris, ran off with his host's wife, right? But that is actually long before the story begins and isn't given that much emphasis, even in the scenes when we're talking about Paris and Menelaus. It's not, not a huge issue. Um, but that is, the, that is the basic motivation. The 24th book of the Iliad as well, of course, where Priam is thoroughly welcomed, paradoxically, into the one tent where he should, by we all expect him not to be treated well, and he is, and it's an absolutely archetypal scene of how to receive a guest politely who's very, very helpless and has very few um, uh, defences, as Hecuba actually is terrified of in, in the beginning of Book 24. But Xenia is not, it just is not the basic driving uh, theme of the Iliad. It is of the Odyssey. This makes it even more surprising to me how little emphasis is actually given to the Telemachus books, because of course he goes to um, two different Greek communities in, in the Peloponnese and is, is treated with extraordinary uh, hospitality. And that all sets up how you should receive people into your community um, especially the Spartan scene with Menelaus and Helen, for all the terrible responses and receptions that Odysseus is going to get um, himself. And of course, the fundamental crime underlying the Odyssey, which is the infringement of Xenia by the suitors who have behaved very badly. He, this is a friend of theirs, somebody who's an ally of theirs, same broadly speaking, nationality is theirs, and they're from the same islands, um, and they have treated, uh, y used his absence to uh, go in, help themselves to his food. A very small number of them plot the death of his son, and a, a very small number of them actually try to uh, get off with his wife. But uh, it structures every level of the Odyssey. It is the story of the Odyssey in every way. So I think that's a very important thing to get through to the young. How difficult is the translation though for Xenia of guest friendship? I think it's a fundamental problem. It sounds like something to do with um, the hospitality industry. It, you know, it sounds like hotels or something. For something that was so extraordinarily important for all ancient communities where any form of travel in hostile territory before United Nations conventions is unbelievably dangerous for all concerned, right? You have every reason in an ancient Mediterranean, which is absolutely full of pirates 
and it always was. It didn't just start with the Romans. People trying to take your boat, uh, abduct you into slavery, where there was no such thing as the United States of Greece. And I think this is really important to get through to the, the young for every level of ancient Greek society is that there was never a Greece. There was never a Greece except for about four years under uh, uh, the Macedonians. And even then it wasn't called Greece, it was, right? But that only lasted for an incredibly short time. There was not one until 1822, right? And so this separate city-state thing is terribly, terribly important, that the Athenians, that you may all get together to fight the Trojans, but that you are completely independent, autonomous city-state. So if Telemachus goes to Sparta, even if there are family ties, even if Penelope's got relatives there, there is no guarantee at all he won't be murdered the minute he crosses the border. None at all, and robbed. So unless you have these overwhelmingly strong taboos and imperatives, which uh, the later Greeks called the unwritten laws, like Antigone calls the one that you must bury your dead, it's the unwritten law that has got nothing to do with individual state law. These are the commonly held values of all the Greek-speaking world and an awful lot of the neighbours of the Greek-speaking world. It has to be that you do not touch a stranger in your territory until you've heard from them and what they're there for and, and, and so on. Nor do you touch your, I hate the word host, the power, the power who runs the state that you have been brave enough to enter. And I, I, I don't actually, I'm not a secondary school teacher, I don't know what, I'd be very interested to hear what a good way of trying to convey that to the young would be. Maybe it's more like sci-fi you know, that the Starship Enterprise just lands on an unknown planet where you simply do not know what the rules are. Um, so you have to have, a, you hope, a system of uh, cosmic law where some sort of herald or forward person is allowed to go in in safety. Look what happens to the men who go forward for Odysseus to Circe. Yeah? They are straight away uh, uh, turned into animals. They have no recompense. So trying to get a sense of that excitement and danger, I think, over that we're in a very, very, very dangerous world with no universal laws. But the poem actually helps to define what universal laws should be by showing people doing them right and doing them wrong. So the Cyclops and Circe uh, are absolutely doing it wrong. <laughs> um, back in Ithaca, it splits down the middle. Penelope is nice to strangers. Um, the, uh, some of the waiting, the, the maid slave, women slaves have, have, have been loyal to Odysseus and don't throw stools at him. Some do. They're divided into half and they get killed if they are horrible to, to strangers. It's very, very strongly put. So that is really important. Uh, when you're teaching Zeus, if you're doing myth and religion, it's very, it, it, a way to link that in is that Zeus is responsible for these unwritten laws. That's when the thunderbolt gets hurled. The thunderbolt, thunderbolt gets hurled, which means people die, you know, if they uh, abuse suppliants, because that's your last resort, is to get onto an altar, right? So it's your last resort when you're desperate, is to get onto an altar, because the even quite atheistical Greeks really believe something terrible could happen to you if you kill someone on an altar. Uh, oaths, again, why are oaths so important? Because they didn't have written contracts, because the world of Homer is, has no literacy even. There is nobody, there's no writing in Homer. You could only have witnesses to sworn oaths. There is no other way. So unless you're absolutely terrified of cosmic justice, if you sworn an oath, then you're not going to keep to it. And in the Iliad, of course, it's Pandarus breaks the truth. He is misled. So oaths are incredibly important. Burying the uh, dead, honoring your parents, the taboo on kin murder, which if you break it will bring on the Iranians, those kinds of things. This is what Zeus is fundamentally in charge of. He's not a local god. Almost all the other gods are actually fairly specific to different kinds of communities. Athena is very, very interesting because 
although she is a very much a local goddess, for example, in Athens. And certain trades, including, guess what, carpenters, yeah, had Athena as their tutelary god for that craft trade. You know, you, 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 Athena was, you'd have had a picture of Athena up in your carpentry workshop. She's also, she's goddess of carpentry and weaving. Um, but Zeus has got this like pan-Hellenic set of responsibilities and both epics define those but Athena is the only Olympian who gets access to that thunderbolt she's the only one that Zeus trusts so her role in the Odyssey is about the justice of Zeus actually although she's very fond of Odysseus it's about getting these suitors back about getting Odysseus home about justice the justice of Zeus and it's a much more advanced theology than the Iliad from that point of view Zeus's power relative to the other gods is much less in the Iliad than the Odyssey, you know, the, the, the strict idea of revenge and justice. So getting those ideas over is very important. Let's have a bit a look at um, my hand, uh, my PowerPoint. Where is the mouse for the big computer? It's over there. And I have to take this with me. So let's think about the character of Odysseus as a hero and this segues into the A level as well so I'll be using quite a lot of other books um, and I want to start with one of his epithets which is in Greek polutropos it's the one that gets the translators incredibly excited what does polutropos mean its literal meaning is something like of many turns. So, a hundred years ago, people used to translate it versatile or resourceful, like a sort of Boy Scout who could, yeah, lots of different kinds of uh, responses and resources you've got to tricky situations, a sort of person who carries, you know, Swiss army knife around with him, that sort of thing. The uh, recent uh, translation by Emily, um, Wilson, much lauded as the first one by a woman, came out last year. It's very good, and it's in blank verse. It is very, very good. It's extremely interesting. She's a wonderful Hellenist and got a great ear for English verse. She caused a huge storm by just translating it. It's right there, tell me the story of the, you know, Polutropos Odysseus muse. She um, translated it. Complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. He's a complicated man which is very very interesting that's a good way perhaps of getting your kids talking about what on earth does polutropos means i think it has another meaning which is actually he's the kind of hero of many different kinds of story and that's actually my the structure of my little talk whether you're doing a level or gcse odysseus is completely central <laughs> most of the other basic big themes and topics you can study you can actually carefully do them like women. We'll have a look at that at the end of this. If you also, if you, each of the women or, or females also throws a light on some aspect of the hero. So you can actually do two essays at once. You can really do Odysseus's hero and women in the Odyssey very, very much in tandem. So these are the epithets of Odysseus alone. This is useful for talking about the key topic of literary techniques and composition to get the kids just to know the actual uh, epithets of Odysseus. So, and they've got a lot of these much ones, poly, 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 much praised. He is the only one in the Odyssey who's much praised. So the Odyssey is about praising him. It's the Odyssey, it's the poem for him. He's extremely crafty. He has a very grievous homecoming, a polycad as nostos. He's got many, many stratagems, polymachinos. Of course, he's much enduring or daring. And that, you'll find different translations. You'll be very confused. Some say all enduring or all daring. They sort of go together. The guy who takes risks <laughs> the most is the guy who ends up in the most trouble. And in fact, the derivation of his name in the famous passage where 
uh, Eura Claire has um, recognized him by his scar, and we get the wonderful flashback to the wounding with the, uh, uh, that gave him the scar. And also, of his birth, we get to see Odysseus right as a little baby. We get his whole life story through the different women. We go right from when he was literally born in Euryclea's scene to the prediction of his death with Tiresia. We, we get pictures of Odysseus at all stages, which is one of the great, incredible things that the, 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 the Homeric author manages to do is without giving you the equivalent of a biopic, which starts at the beginning and goes to the end, still manages to give you the flashes back and forward, um, which Aristotle said was what made uh, the two Homeric epics so much better than all the others, which we haven't got. It's quite interesting. Apparently, all the others were quite episodic. They started at the beginning. Aristotle, in the poetic, <laughs> says, this is what makes Homer the great artist or the author of the Homeric epics, the great artist, is that he doesn't do that. He gives you quite short periods of time. So the entire events of the Odyssey 13 to 24, you know, it's a matter of a few days uh, in a month. We're really waiting for the full moon and weddings and, and things like that. Are you with me? And even the, his scene in Phaeacia, although he tells you about many years of wandering, he tells it within a single day and night in Phaeacia. So this extraordinary sophistication with time is something to, and it'll really help your, any child who wants to learn creative writing. I mean, <laughs> how to tell a story through a single day. You get the same with Greek tragedy, uh, how we get the entire history of, of uh, well, Oedipus's life story, you know, in, the single day he found out who he, who he was. So those, and versatile or complex, he does have other epithets which are shared with other people, and these are the ones that give you more of his actual features. He's master mariner, he's a hero, he's great-hearted, he's wise, he's a city sacker, he's kingly, he's of many sorrows and much prayed for. So those, very helpful for structuring an essay about narrative technique and formulae, or about Odysseus himself. So what kind of hero is he? We are, 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 are cinemas abound in different kinds of hero, obviously. Um, I've put Spider-Man, James Bond, and Batman, which rather shows my age. I'm quite sure the young could give you an awful lot more but actually asking them what kind of hero is he? Does he actually have superpowers? Does he actually have super equipment? Is he actually supernatural? Is he born in any way of a god? Well, he's not. I mean, he's not. He's an incredibly mortal hero, much more so than Achilles, of, of course. Um, does he have any particular superpowers? Not really, apart from his brain. He's got an incredibly clever Right. He doesn't get, like, Heracles to, to, to have magical weapons or, or, or anything like that. Occasionally, gods give him something semi-magical, like Hermes gives him the magic root that stops him turning into an a animal, protects him. He gets bits of help. Leucothea gives him the uh, scarf when he's drowning after his raft breaks up. But he does not have any of his own. Right, it is all about him, which is very important. I'm trying to, I, I think he's nearest to James Bond, myself, who is just incredibly clever and has a different lady in every film, <laughs> if you like. It's not quite the same because he, he's Odysseus of books one to 12. He's not Odysseus of books 13 to 24. You might have to have a different hero like Clint Eastwood, again, I'm betraying my age, you would have to get the, the young thinking about that. But all those movies Clint Eastwood made about the guy whose wife and daughter have been raped and murdered and he comes back home 20 years later and shoots all the bad guys. Yeah? That, I think it's like James Bond in the first half and Clint Eastwood in the second half. But that is why, when I say he's Polutropos, he's a kind of hero of many different kinds of story. When I wrote my book on the Odyssey, I wanted to call it the mother of all stories. 
um, the publisher wouldn't let me. But I mean, I do really believe it's the, the mother. It's got every kind of story in it. So you can get the kids thinking about that. Oh, wrong computer. So what are his actual skills? Well, these are quite quick to trundle through, but you've got to get them to illustrate them from the text. He's a brilliant navigator who does something quite phenomenal with Scylla and Charybdis because he has to go a little bit closer to one than the other because he's going to lose slightly fewer men if he goes close to Scylla. I mean, it's an extraordinarily difficult navigational feat he's given very deliberately, not just any old difficult feat. Barbarism and civilization is one of the themes. Uh, civilization and barbarism are places and characters. Well, some of his earliest exploits that he reports, especially with the Lystragonians, the Cyclops, are about simply uh, attacking and making off with goods from um, a less advanced civilization. And this is where the sort of anthropology of the Odyssey really comes in. It's been very fashionable since the 1980s. So those of you who studied classics at all since the 1980s have probably heard this, but two very famous French scholars uh, conveniently both began with V. It was Vidal Marquet and Vernon, but they wrote this whole book uh, or article about how you've got two worlds in the Odyssey, one of them, the real world of Ithaca and poverty and peasant small holdings, because it's a really very poor island when you know, he's only got 50 trees <laughs> um, and he can't do crops very well. There's very little arable farming, there are no horses. So the, the small holding peasant farmer of the 7th century, 8th, 7th century BCE, who has to be very good at basic handicrafts, right? The real hero is the one who can make a boat, you know, and fish and so on. And then the anthropologically completely other world of the wanderings, which is supernatural and everything is very extreme and indeed inverted. It's somehow or other inverted, so women are often in charge. And Vernon and, Vid Vernot and Vidal Marquet, I can spell those for you later, argued that the wanderings basically define patriarchy, which is what's got to be right and proper, in Ithaca by having societies where women have too much or distorted or peculiar levels of power, whether it is Calypso and Circe running their own islands, whether it's Queen Arete, who in Phaeacia seems to have a, an excessive amount of power, and even the sort of monstrous things like Scylla and Charybdis and the Sirens are feminine, even if they're not female. So. It's quite a big challenge for GCSE, but I was interested when you talked uh, talking earlier about the word women putting people off. You know, to me, it's just screaming gender. You do women and men. You, 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 you do how men and women, definitions of, stereotypes of, ideals of, notions of good and bad behavior of, play off each other. And you can sort of bring that in if you talk about, um, this is really more for the, the women course, but the ancient Greeks themselves invented a sort of table where masculinity and femininity were tied up to various different qualities. So masculinity is, is right and pure and straight and true and light, yeah? And even numbered, femininity is dark and dirty and left-handed and wild and plural and all that kind of thing. Um, I used to do a very, uh, you can do a very, very simple question of them on this. You can say, okay, knife and fork, which is masculine, which is feminine? I hope they all say that the knife is masculine because if they don't, then this game won't work. But they usually do. So the younger they are, the less theoretically advanced they are. Uh, so knife, gotta be male, phallic, whatever cuts. If you then say fork, you just said fork is a girl, yeah? <laughs> fork and spoon, the fork has to go male in this kind of crude binary thinking, yeah? Knife and spoon is sort of to, to, to overcompound it. And the Greeks did this a lot with, with ancient societies. So, for example, in Herodotus, 
uh, Greeks are masculine, Persians are obviously feminine, right? They got real problems, though. They then added Scythians to the narrative. I, I'm really serious. Things got really, really difficult. Were the Scythians more or less feminine than the Persians? And then they started fighting. Seriously, the anthropologists like yours started arguing about that. <laughs> but introducing the idea of this relational gender, that we gender everything, right? Uh, we shouldn't do, and actually a lot of these, certainly the A-level kids, are really interested in this because of all the trans stuff, like what makes something feminine or masculine. Well, nothing actually. It's entirely cultural. And then you can kind of get them to think about the Odyssey in terms of how it cultures certain kinds of things, like powerful women, yeah, or a certain kind of uh, luxury, you know, as feminine. Let's puddle on. All right, so here's the favorite of the cleverest goddess. Her role in the Odyssey is extraordinary. It's very, very, very highlighted, actually, even in just the GCSE books. Um, her role, even in book 22 alone, where she upbraids Odysseus, where she turns into a swallow to watch and flies up to, if you just trace Athena, just in book 22 in the final showdown, where she holds up the Aegis when they're in serious trouble, which, you know, she actually joins in, in, in the battle in a far more committed way than any god does in the Iliad. You know, very, very partisan. But she is also goddess very precisely of war, but not the war that Ares symbolizes. Ares symbolizes mindless violence. Yeah. He's the only god in the Iliad who fights on both sides. He can't figure out what side he's on. Athena says, for heaven's sake, he's like one of those football thugs who get into a, hit everybody in the, in the bar. Um, Athena is about advanced planning, which is, of course, the story of the entire second half of the Odyssey. It's about advanced, what the Greeks call promethia, um, forethought, thinking about things through, tactics, getting those weapons hidden, biding your time, waiting for the feast when all the uh, suitors are actually drunk so that you can get the door locked on them, you know. Endless waiting, and that's very Clint Eastwood. Um, athlete and discus thrower. He um, isn't a runner. He says so. He never has been a runner. But he throws the discus far, far further than anyone else in book eight of the Odyssey, thus proving his aristocratic credentials because he's been taunted as being just an ordinary lower bourgeois merchant. And he says, oh, no, I'm not. I too had much leisure as a youth because I'm rich and aristocratic. Here's me throwing the discus. He is a phenomenal carpenter, which is, of course, Athena's um, great gift. And we have two objects in the Odyssey, the extraordinary description, which the Greek of which is some of the hardest Greek anybody's ever had to do because none of us, we were all translating it when we were at Oxford doing our Odyssey. I had no idea what all these bits of things that carpenters used were. So you just, you sort of just learnt the rope turn because I had no idea what a thole pin was, you know. But uh, it's very, very elaborate and would have been very pleasurable for any ancient carpenter to hear, you know. There's, there's things in there for quite... The Odyssey assumes an audience interested in quite lowly crafts in a way the Iliad doesn't. It's aimed at a lower class of audience. And of course, the amazing bed, very important to remember what a brilliant hunter he is. Um, already on Circe's Island, um, we hear him say to the Phaeacians how he struck the stag with a bronze spear in the center of his back and he planted his foot on his carcass. He drew the bronze spear from the wound, laid it on the ground, gathered willow shoots, wove a rope six foot long, spliced them together. This is basically a recipe for how to get a large animal back from the hunt to the home. And the uh, hunting thing is very, very much carried on in the bath scene with Eurycleia. We hear about how he got the original wound. It was out hunting. One of the recognition symbols is about the brooch with a hunting scene on it. And the similes in book 22, I put some of them in for you, are very much about wild animals so don't let them forget he's a hunter. I found historically undergraduates always forget the hunting. He's, of course, a brilliant swimmer. I don't know why I put, found that picture. I found that picture years ago, and I just, like, I just think it's OK. 
but I love this swimming thing. You know, it's, it's, it's 125 lines or something, the account of him his struggling in the water. And again, the ancient Greeks prided themselves on their swimming schools. They said that's one of the reasons they won at places like Salamis against the Persians who couldn't swim. They were brilliant swimmers and divers. And the story says to be a proper Greek peasant farming hero, you've got not only to be able to fish and hunt and make boats, you've got to be able to swim. And I love it. It's the first great epic swim in, 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 in extant literature. Actually, it's Turnus in the Aeneid who gets to swim across rivers. Beowulf takes him a week to get back from the Frisian Islands to Essex, kills five whales on the way. Julius Caesar swam across the uh, whole of the Alexandrian Bay with a bond in his, his mouth. Mao Zedong swam the Yangtze. One of Saddam Hussein's model, you know, lookalikes swam the Euphrates. Odysseus started to proper. Putin does that stuff all the time. Goes wild swimming. You know, it's <laughs> all right. Boxer, fight with Iris. Archer, of course. Trickster, and there's no trickery in the Iliad except in the book about Dolon, which is the one people always leave out, where it's Odysseus is the trickster. He likes to do things, and this might help with the superheroes. He likes darkness, he likes undercover, he likes indoors, he likes night, he likes all the things that Achilles hates. Achilles always says, I want to be out there in the daylight, face to face with my enemy. He likes darkness. This is Batman do it at night. Yeah, I think he's pretty much at night, isn't he? So that's a sort of nocturnal, dark, indoors trickery. Um, he is desired uh, overwhelmingly by uh, both Calypso and Nausicaa. I believe one of the functions of book eight, well, the whole Phaeacian episode, but mainly eight, is to show us what he was like when he met Penelope. We. Of course, the affair comes to nothing with Nausicaa. It's never going to. But we're given a hint that it might. He's transformed into a gorgeous young man, his hair like hyacinth curls. It's a wonderful description of how he looked. We know that she fancies him or that you know, she's woken up saying, Daddy, Daddy, I want to wash my trousseau because I think I want to get married. She goes down to the beach, a naked man comes towards her. I mean, it's kind of overwritten, if you know what I mean. But I think that's so we get to see him as the young bridegroom. He tames Circe by the only really sexually exciting scene in the Odyssey. You can talk to your kids about this if you dare these days. But when she goes at him with the sword out, and then we hear, and he stayed a whole year completely unnecessarily, <laughs> it's about as sexy as it gets. It's a lot more sexy than book 22. They got back into bed, and, and, and then he told her everything that had happened all night. Thanks, Odysseus. It, that's, not, that's not the James Bond scene in the bath with the supermodel, is it? No. OK, investigative scientists, I'm, I'm, I'm coming near the end. One of the questions which does come up on exam papers, and might, it's a very, very all-purpose topic, which could be used in, in commentary passages or almost any essay, is does a disease change or develop? And believe it or not, there are scholars who say one thing and scholars who say the other. I am very, very profoundly of the view that a disease does develop in one very specific way. When he goes to the land of the Cyclops, actually they don't go to the island, they go to an island next door called Goat Island, which is uninhabited. Odysseus, uh, Homer is very, very clear about this. Even Odysseus is very, very clear about this. This is him describing himself. All they need is enough food and water, and they're all actually nearly home, and they're mostly still alive. Yeah? What happens? Odysseus says, I hear voices coming from next door island. I cannot bear this curiosity. I have to go and find out what kind of beings they are. Are they hospitable? Do they do good xenia? What do they speak? You know, I have to go, guys. I'm sorry, right? So they all go over to the island of the Cyclops, and he ends up not only losing the ones that are eaten, breaking all kinds of laws of xenia himself, and you should discuss that with your students. Nobody's invited him into that cave. That's a colonial issue. 
it's, it's the implication that if people are backward enough or monstrous enough, Senia doesn't apply to them, that you can go into their cave and eat their cheese, right? Because he plays exactly as the suitors does, do. But then, of course, the actual big curse that Polyphemus lays on him at the end of that book, when he cannot bear but not tell Polyphemus who he is, Polyphemus is hurling the stones at him, he just can't shut his mouth when he needed to more than ever, right? He'd got away with saying, I am no man. He can't bear it. His desire for kleos and time, fame and honour, those two words are in there, is too strong. He has not learnt self-control. Okay? He has to learn it, and he has learnt it by the time he gets back to Ithaca, and we have at least three scenes where somebody says something nasty to him or throws a stool at him, um, and we actually hear he was angry in his midriff, <laughs> in, his, you know, in his guts, but bided his time. He did, does not say, who do you think I am, I'm Odysseus then, does he? So he learns self-control, I believe, through the incident with Cyclops. My proof is actually the uh, sirens. So he's been told by Circe that the sirens know everything. They are omniscient. They know all of the past and the future. They know everything. There was once long ago a Doctor Who episode like this with Christopher Eccleston, and I was getting to see the whole of the past, present, and future. Do you, do you remember one of the early ones of the new, the new sequence? He's been given that promise, but he's equally been told, you know, that, 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 that if, he go, if he hears it, they will all die. He has learnt to use his brain. This is the first controlled experiment, scientific experiment, in world literature, right? So he has figured out a way to protect his men this time, where he put them into such danger. As, his, as Eurylicus, Eurylicus remembers on Circe's Island, he says, you really, really did it with us, on the Cyclops. You know, I just don't trust you. We even hear his lieutenant say that and criticize him for it. He protects them all. He sets it all up so he can assuage that boundless curiosity, which makes him a completely different hero from any other hero. I mean, he is the ancient Greek intellect, you know, out there doing science. <laughs> doing history, doing philosophy. You know, he's this massive intellect, but he controls it. And he has learnt that between the Cyclops and the Sirens. And I think so the self-control and ability to be humiliated and take it for now, biding your time, laying with Athena your... Yeah? This is the nature of him. He's, of course, a great storyteller and autobiographer, and that's why I think these books for GCSE in particular have been chosen. <laughs> the Visit to the Land of the Dead. Is 11 on? Does it, is 11 on the A level? Yes. Well, that's incredible. We won't go into it anymore now. Employer and pet owner. You will always get the uh, kids going on Argos. Exactly whether the maids deserve what comes to them is one that I don't know if you found your young... Am I going on too long? Am I right? I'd better stop in a minute. They're young. Uh, it is extremely um, barbaric what happens to them, and it can be quite good to get people putting arguments one side and the other. I think the reason they have to die, this is, makes it very clear, is the most difficult, actually, for a modern audience to understand. And that is simply that they were his property. They're completely his property. Their vaginas are his property. And in ancient Greek world, somebody who owned a lot of female slaves had the right to give that slave for sex to someone else, as, either as a gift or for money. You own it. It is actually like what they do to him is theft. All right? It, it, it's not quite the disloyalty, loyalty thing that, or whether they're allowed to have, have sex. They do not have the right to give sexual services out because the money should go to Odysseus or the permission come from him. Do you, do you see what I mean? Explaining that to your young may be quite difficult, but that is what they have done wrong, is that they have uh, used equipment that belongs to him without his permission. That's actually very disturbing, but true. Okay, I'm nearly there. Father, well, 
frankly, <laughs> again, you can discuss that. Does he make up for his 19 years away? And with husband. I love that vase because it shows a tradition I believe existed in antiquity that the dog was used in the recognition. I do. There's an Irish version of the Odyssey that goes back to medieval times where it's Argos who recognises him, runs across the entire palace, licks him, and Penelope says, I, you are my husband. And, that's, and then dies. I think there was a tradition, and that vase is the proof. Son of an orchard keeper, so all that farming business tends to get ignored today because we're not interested in planting rows of vines, at least most 18-year-olds aren't. But the ancient audience was very interested in, in growing those sorts of things. So he is all of these things. He is a quest hero, even though the quest is for home, not for a golden fleece or a grail. It is a quest. He is an action hero. We like to see him going in and uh, doing lots of actions, whether it's sport or navigation or whatever. He is a disaster movie hero. What happens in the Cyclops Island, and as, they, as he loses the ships and his men, it's, we have a lot of terrible disasters coming down on him in the first half. He's absolutely the Clint Eastwood revenge hero. Uh, we keep that for book 22, just as it's kept for book 22 in the Iliad for Achilles, finally, Teal Hector. It's a sort of road movie, travelogue, road movie hero in a way. You know, you go on, you go on a long journey and you see what comes up. Certainly the wandering is part of it. It's quite interesting that he and Telemachus both get their little road trips before they meet up. You've got these sort of parallel... You can have these, these slides will all be made available to you guys, I promise. Um, they'll all be going up on the ACE website. He's, of course, a romantic hero, the separated lovers, plot of every novel will they get to kiss at the end yes they will i think he's a sort of proto sci-fi hero and by that i mean these peculiar inverted worlds that we go and see these strange places where you know there are gigantic women like the lystrogonians or people are turned into animals that's much more like episodes of star trek every planet you land on there's anthropological question how do they work you know what sort of equipment have they got? In Phaeacia, they don't even have to farm, right? It's, it, it, it's semi-sci-fi, that anthropology. Um, and is he an initiation hero? OK, the great initiation novel. Many, many epics are initiatory. They're about young men growing up, killing their first man, sleeping their first woman. Uh, very many of them have that sort of structure. Um, Odysseus, I think, does develop, but it's scarcely initiation. What we've got is a strange foiled initiation plot with Telemachus. And I think you should talk to your young about them. I mean, he's 19. He's given by <coughs> Helen of Troy, no less, <coughs> a beautiful negligee to give to his bride in book three. That's one of the presents. So we're told, you know, we're all set up in book three for Telemachus to get laid, basically, right? We're waiting for that. Does it happen? No, it doesn't. He does kill his first man, and that's in defending his own father, and it's very exciting indeed um, in book 22. And if you actually read the sequence of murders, of uh, murders, deaths, killings, in book 22, it, it, it is very excitingly written and very cinematic. But something doesn't quite work for poor old Telemachus. So he gets, he really should, having gone off to Pylos and Sparta and got the nighty, <laughs> he should at least get a maidservant at the end or something. But he doesn't. So you've got a strange, stunted, Oedipal situation. We even hear he was capable of d doing the bow, and it's only Odysseus staring at him that stops it. So it's, it's a strange, strange plot. But that is why I think he's Polutropos. So, should we do a workshop? I would like people to go off into groups or on their own if they really feel nobody else agrees with them. I'm not very good at this. You see, I'm not a secondary school teacher. I don't know how to do this. 
Groups. Do you want me to allocate groups? Three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah? And I want you to firstly decide which kind of superhero he is most like. And I mean, uh, you probably know ones, you know, I don't know about Metal Man or whatever he's called. <laughs> uh, what, which, you're going to find a superhero you think he's most like, yeah, and you're going to find bits in the text or try and remember enough to put together a little essay, yeah, between you, just a little talk. If you can't remember anything in the Odyssey, I'm sure one of the other three will. Secondly, I want you to tell me which actor, famous actor, you would cast if you were directing this cinematic movie. Um, the reason I ask that is, actually, I find it's a very good question to find out whether kids are clever or not. I, th I really mean it. They think that they're not, you're not really asking them an academic question. But when you, same with Aeneas, actually, who's such a snake, you know? <laughs> but if you ask them not just who, but then why, you can find out a lot about how much they know the epics or how responsively and, and committedly they're reading them. So which actor would you? And I asked that because poor old Sean Bean, who was a love. I mean, he's, I love Hunky Yorkshireman. I mean, it's fine. Um, I think he was great as, as Sharp. Was it Sharp? Yeah, you know what I mean? Good old Peninsula War <laughs> captain. Fantastic. He is not clever enough to have been uh, I thought he was a disaster in Troy. Just got to be quite a lot cleverer. He just doesn't look intelligent enough. It's the right kind of build. We, you know, we hear that he wasn't very that tall, but he was very barrel-chested and broad-shouldered. That's just my personal view. If one of you wants to defend Sean Bean, but you know that thing where he's carving that bit of wood. Do you remember in Troy? And he says, <laughs> he sort of sees a horse. <laughs> So, should we have five minutes break?